It's week six, and without a doubt, the easiest ad of the week is the Underdog Fantasy app to your mobile phone, okay? You guys like that plug? It's pretty good. If you download the Underdog Fantasy app right now, they're going to give you a free square of Brock Purdy half a yard on Thursday Night Football. This will be up until Thursday. You've got three days to download the damn app. They just want you on the platform. They, they're they giving you a damn free square, okay? And if you sign up with code BDGE, they're going to hit you with a deposit bonus, and that's actually how you get the square, okay? My fingers are pointing all over the wrong places. But if you want the free square, if you want free money, that's how you get it. BDGE, promo code $10 or more on the Underdog app. But as always, we are jumping into the waiver wire ads of the week. For week six, we go through the trending players up and down, tell you who you should drop at the end, but more importantly, tell you who you should add at the beginning. All right, we're going to go position by position in this one instead of just the most added players. We have Tank Bigsby up top. Now, this should come as no surprise. He should be owned in any serious league, but he has now finally outsnapped for the first week Travis Etienne. He obviously is looking far more explosive. He's looking like the better runner, the better in-between-the-tackles runner. Etienne, he's got, like, no juice right now. He's not making anything happen out there. So it feels like Tank has kind of forced this uh, Bucky Irving, Rashad White situation where maybe Tank scores the touchdowns from now on. That being said, I don't think there's a world where they don't just use both backs at a pretty premium level here. Uh, I think Tank is warranting you know 50 percent of the work but i still think etn has a track record of being this home run hitter an explosive playmaker and an offense that needs playmakers like that right he hasn't really shown it this year i understand that but he does have this resume of showing it for multiple years he obviously has a chemistry with trevor lawrence dating back to their days at clemson so i don't think there's ever going to be like a full you know workhorse takeover like we saw travis etn last year you know commanding 80 percent of the touches but tank's been great and he's someone that i think you could start kind of immediately i'm a little hesitant they play in london this upcoming week and london games are notoriously just like low scoring sloppy games so he has, I would say, a relatively low floor because there are games where he might get seven carries and one target, and if he doesn't bust off a huge run, which he's doing pretty frequently right now, he can give you a low floor game. But you could definitely do worse than someone who is starting to command more and more uh, work because he is right now the most efficient running back in the NFL. And I'll put this tweet thread on the screen right now, but in terms of like rushing yards over expectation, in terms of yards after contact, in terms of like his overall speed, and he didn't come into the league as a speed guy, but he is making breakaway plays as if Travis Etienne was the one who was doing it, right? ETN feels like he got space jammed his powers a little bit from Tank Bigsby. Moving down the list, Rico's not available in any serious leagues. Roshan Johnson getting a lot of the goal line work, but Swift has looked a lot better recently, and I think they're just riding the hot hand here. I do think Roshan should be owned because if something happens to Swift, Roshan will play a very large role in the passing game and on the ground game and on the goal line. And the Chicago Bears offense is playing a lot better than we've seen in the previous weeks. They've gone against really, really light opponents, but they will pretty much continue getting those light opponents because you have Jacksonville, you have a bye, then you get Washington, Arizona, New England, Green Bay. Like there is no one scary on that schedule for the next month or so. So despite it being maybe fluky and maybe just a product of the defenses that they are playing against, Chicago should probably still keep improving and keep improving and a lot of times like with momentum it just ends up turning into something that's important so if you could string together you know three four or five strong games regardless of the opponent sometimes things just click in that time span so Roshan needs to be owned and probably the most exciting waiver wire pickup of the week at the running back position is Tyrone Tracy this was a rookie this year that we loved in dynasty so a lot of y'all probably got him in your rookie drafts third fourth round whatever he was a kid that played wide receiver for four years at college, switched positions when he transferred over Purdue to running back, broke out, got drafted as a running back, obviously, and exploded in this game with Devin Singletary out with a groin injury, 18 carries, 129 yards, only one reception, which is kind of disappointing given the fact that he was a wide receiver. He's 5'11", 210, so he's got speed, right? He ran, I think, a 4'4", 7", or 4'4", at the combine. He's got size, 210 pounds. He's got three down ability. Like I said, he's a good runner, 7.2 yards per carry, and he played wide receiver. So, with that, Eric Gray was kind of like the starter in this game. He ended up going like three for 50 in the receiving game and started off really hot and then fumbled on the goal line, which eventually made the Giants turn to Tyrone Tracy, and then he ran away with the job. Now, we don't know what the status of Devin Singletary's groin injury is. He missed this week. He could be back this upcoming week. He might miss another week or two. They play Cincinnati, and Cincinnati is a matchup. So if Tracy is available... I think he's talented enough to force a timeshare with Devin Singletary. Singletary has been good this year, though. I don't want to take that away, and I don't want to say, like, it's Tracy's job now. But Tracy is a talented enough player 
on all three downs that I think he should force a committee that's 60-40 at worst. And I think Tracy's a dude that can make explosive plays. And to be honest with you, again, like Singletary's played well enough that I don't know that it benefits their offense so much to give Tracy a workhorse role. But again, if something happens to Singletary and Tracy takes over a workhorse role, he could be a high upside RB2 for the rest of the season. Now with Cincy, this game, if Devin Singletary does miss time, like I'm throwing Tracy immediately into my lineup as an RB2, Sunday Night Football, weak defense. Since he might be getting back one or two of their defensive tackles, which would be a huge boost to their run game, so I would keep an eye on their practice injury reports. Um, but Tracy is definitely a top ad for me. And in terms of fab, like if Tank's available on your wire, you're you're throwing 10 to 15%. If Tracy's available on your wire, I think I'd go the same the same amount there. It's It's tough to talk yourself into a real upside case with either of these guys outside of injury. So I think they both either have or could develop standalone value. Like Tank already has it. Tracy could get it if he continues to play really well with Devin Singletary out. But, you know, if things don't go their way, there's a world where, you know, they're both getting six to eight touches a game and you feel really hesitant putting them into your lineup. So I think both are equal chances of going in either direction. So I won't overspend there. Kareem Hunt, not available in serious leagues. What is Ramondre, Devontae, Devin Singletary doing on these lists? Cam Akers, yeah, I'm out on that. I would say Darian Gumbawale is not a bad ad right now. He's been getting so much of the pass catching work. He played a lot more than Cam Akers in this one. Looks way more explosive when you actually watch them play. I think there is a world where because Darius played so well over the last three weeks while Joe Mixon's been gone, that he actually continues to take that pass catching role in Houston when Joe Mixon returns. Like there's no reason to give Joe Mixon 30 touches a game because now we see what happens, especially coming off the high ankle sprain. So Dari kind of feels a little bit like Justice Hill, where it's like a good offense. He's obviously never going to be your workhorse. You already have a much more talented back in front of him, but in really good game scripts, and he's relatively like a you know an explosive guy that can make a big play on any given touch. I think Dari, you could do worse in deeper leagues and PPR leagues. Now, Ty Chandler is not on this list. I don't know why, but Ty Chandler absolutely needs to be picked up in every league, and he is flirting with the top running back pickup of the week for me. The downside here is obviously that Minnesota has a bye coming up. Aaron Jones got hurt in this previous game in London. He's dealing with a hip slash hamstring injury. Most of the doctors that I follow think this is more closely related to a hamstring injury, which would be a multi-week lingering injury. Doesn't mean it's a multi-week absence. Obviously, they have the bye. There's a possible timeline where Aaron Jones does not miss any time. But I've also seen some doctors have concerns that this will linger into their week seven matchup. Okay, so week six bye. Maybe gets right. Maybe they sit him out for the week seven matchup. And if that's the case, Ty Chandler probably takes over as a workhorse. Like we saw a game last year where Alexander Madison was, I don't remember if he was benched or hurt, whatever it was. Ty Chandler was the one there and he got like 23, 25 touches. So they trust him. I don't know how good Ty Chandler actually is, to be completely honest with you. I think he's cool. I think they trust him. I think he has some explosion to his game. So I think uh, he has that going for him. The multi-week injury for Aaron Jones is obviously concerning for a player his age. So Ty Chandler absolutely needs to be picked up. The other low-key pickup that I think needs to happen is Blake Corum. So Blake Corum finally jumped Ronnie Rivers in the depth chart. I don't know why it took this long. Got like five carries, looked pretty good, caught a ball or two, whatever. Uh, He has no standalone value right now. However, if he is now clearly, again, the number two back on the depth chart, this Rams offense... While, you know, they're staying in games, they're not performing very well. They're going to get better as the season progresses because after their bye, they're projected to get Cooper cut back. Their offensive linemen will eventually get healthy. By like week seven, eight, nine, they'll start to have that offensive line back that they entered the year with, which don't forget was a top five run blocking line in the NFL. And then you have Kyron, who is clearly a workhorse right now. He's fucking goaded in fantasy. But he's also dealt with a lot of lower body injuries. He tweaks his ankle again. You know, something happens with an MCL sprain, whatever the case may be. And Blake Quorum's the number two up behind an offense that's improving. He becomes a really high upside stash for the second half of the season. So if you've got guys that are just kind of hanging around your bench right now, like if you have Emmanuel Wilson, if you have guys in like that range, Zamir White, like I would stash Blake Quorum over those dudes. Let's move on to the wide receivers. Now, Jalen Tolbert is the top ad this week by pure volume, and that comes as a uh, product of him having a big game on Sunday Night Football against the Steelers. 10 targets, 7 catches, 87 yards, and a touchdown. Now, Tolbert, I've been a fan of his game. I don't think he's anything special, but he's in a 
pretty special opportunity here because Brandon Cooks is going to be out for another like three, four weeks probably dealing with some knee infection. He was kind of cooked. He looked dusty as shit regardless before the injury happened. I think Tolbert is probably going to stay as the wide receiver too in this offense that's going to be passing a lot going forward especially in this game against Detroit where their outside corners give up a lot of production and they score a lot of points so other teams need to pass the ball a lot obviously it's CD it's Jake Ferguson and then it's Jalen Tolbert but being in a CD lamb offense takes so much pressure off you as the wide receiver too at the same time obviously there are going to be games that run directly through CD where there's no scraps left for the wide receiver too so his floor is really low but we've also seen like we just literally saw a game where he put up 22 fantasy points in PPR league so the ceiling is certainly there for Tolbert in this offense. He is someone that I would probably in that 10 to 15% fab range, 8 to eight to 15 in that range. I wouldn't go crazy because, again, like it's scary starting players with such a low floor, but the opportunity is certainly there. Darnell Mooney is not available in any serious leagues. Darius Slayton won't really be a player once Malik Neighbors is back. Ray Ray McLeod, you could do worse. He's like clearly a target getter in this Atlanta offense as the offense is continuing to like – get better and better and better and Kirk's throwing more and they are starting to become filled with more and more chemistry Ray McLeod's a sneaky little ad here Josh Downs should not be available anywhere he would be my top wide receiver pickup of the week if he is available in your leagues I would drop 15 20 percent he's a target magnet he is explosive he is again I said this on last week's waiver wire show when I told y'all to pick him up he feels like Wondell Robinson with juice He's one of the best contested catch receivers literally in the NFL. He was so good at it at UNC. And with Joe Flacco, he is becoming this like target share monster. Obviously, when a rich returns, it's a little bit of a damper on all fantasy wide receivers there. But I still think him and Downs will have a, a good connection there. And he'll operate as their safety valve without a real tight end that catches passes here. So I like Josh Downs regardless of who's at quarterback. And I think the most polarizing name of the week probably has to be Juju Smith-Schuster after last night's game. So a little blast from the past here. Seven catches on eight targets, 130 yards. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, Juju looked pretty good. I didn't, think, I didn't think this man was capable of pulling off a game like he did last night. I didn't think that shit was still in his bag, okay? So when I'm looking at Juju, obviously Rashi Rice is now done for the year. The targets in this offense have to go somewhere it's very clear that Xavier Worthy is not the answer to their problems here he's just not a possession receiver he's a he's a like a, a gadgety gimmicky receiver that will make some big plays but in terms of being a possession receiver obviously Kelsey gets gets his bag back Juju played on 65 ish percent of the snaps last night which was kind of surprising I think his performance probably earned him a bigger snap share and what I guess is more interesting is that like you'd kind of look at that number and say oh he probably was just the slot wide receiver he was probably playing on 11 personnel and then sat when they were in 12 personnel wasn't wasn't the case really he ran about 57 percent of his routes on the outside so he was moving all over the formation and and you know Kansas City kind of plays a little bit of like positionless ball on offense so I don't want to like harp on that I think the performance probably earned him more targets or uh, more snaps going forward at whose expense? I don't know. Justin Watson's, Xavier Worthy, whatever. It's clear that Mahomes and Juju have a little bit of chemistry still left over from that campaign a couple of years ago when Juju was their leading receiver in yards. So with Juju, man, there might be some staying power here just because they've got nowhere else to go with the ball. So if I'm if I'm looking for a high ups, you know, I, I compare Josh Downs to Wondell Robinson. Juju kind of feels like he's Wondell in Kansas City offense, which you can definitely do worse. He feels like he could shape up as a high floor wide receiver three for the rest of the season. Now, obviously, we're going to have some dud games going forward, no doubt about it. But with the amount of opportunity available in this offense, without a real running back of consequence, without a real wide receiver one of consequence, like I kind of think Juju is probably worthy of dropping a decent chunk of fab here on him. So if you want to go in that 15, like Josh Downs is probably not available for you. So if you weren't, if you need a wide receiver and you want to drop some fab, on a dude like Juju I got no problem with you know 12 15 if you're really desperate for wide receiver and want to go north of 20 20 25 I think he'll be a really popular pickup this week and that's probably what you're gonna have to spend on him so I don't think I'd blame you but there will probably be some bumpy weeks and roads ahead so don't be surprised when that shit happens Jordan Whittington big PPR game we were very high on him coming into the week so Nothing really changes here except post buy. That didn't make any sense because something does absolutely change here. Jordan Winnington will take a backseat to Cooper Cup if he returns post buy. They said he's going to return post buy. 
I will believe it when I see it. That is not something I feel super confident in despite the reports. We'll probably start getting practice reports next week. That being said, though, I still think Jordan Whittington will play like the Puka role while Cooper Cup plays the Cup role. I think there is still meat left on the bone here for Whittington to make some plays. And I don't think you should drop him despite having the buy, despite the cup news. I still think he's someone that like he's probably going to be dropped in more leagues and he will be added in. And I would go and try to pick him up because one, if Cooper Cup doesn't play the week after the buy, he becomes like a really solid wide receiver three in PPR leagues. In my opinion, just because the way that the scheme and the offense is set up, it's for dudes like him to prosper. So he's someone I would definitely keep my eye on. Xavier Hutchinson, I think he's a fine pickup here, uh, given the fact that Nico Collins is probably going to miss this week with a hamstring injury. Might be a multi-week absence. I think what's probably more likely is that just Diggs and Tank Dell end up scooping up most of the targets, and they become like the benefactors of it. Maybe Dalton Schultz gets more uh, involved than he has been this year. But then again, you know, you look at the games that like Noah Brown played in last year, and I don't see Zave and Noah Brown as, as two different of players or profiles. So, with Hutch, I think he's a decent deeper league ad that obviously has an extremely low floor. But again, we saw games with Noah Brown putting up like 170 yards last year when uh, Tank Dell missed time or Nico Collins missed time. And obviously they didn't have dig, so the target share got even more condensed. But you guys get the point. Like anyone on any given week can produce in a C.J. Stroud type offense. They play New England next week and then Green Bay the week after that. So you're talking about two matchups where their top cornerback is likely going to shadow the top receiver on the other team probably if I'm opposing teams I'm looking at Diggs as the number one right now Nico's off the table so you got Christian Gonzalez on Diggs you got Jair Alexander on Diggs and at this point in his career I don't know if Diggs is really like the separator that beats those guys so we could be looking at more of a even condensed target share to you know Tank Dell to dudes like Xavier Hutchinson so um, with him playing 71 percent of the snaps after Nico Collins got hurt that is pretty uh, pointing in the direction of like where we should be looking here. He's six through he's six three, he's two ten, so he kind of fills that big X receiver role that Nico Collins was playing. Alan Lazard, Romeo Dobbs are all very highly owned. Alec Pierce, I mean, what can I say that you guys don't already know? The dude has a game of seven targets. Every other game was three targets or less. Sometimes he connects on a deep ball. Sometimes he doesn't. Like there's just I'm not gonna sit here and try to pretend like I know when he's gonna do that for you. So I'm not even gonna waste my breath. Some other ads that I think are worth looking into, if people dropped Quentin Johnson because they were on a bye week, would definitely pick him back up. The Chargers should be healthier, and he was getting a ton of targets from Justin Herbert. So don't sleep on Mr. Johnstein over there. And then I saw Trey Tucker's name down here. Tucker's a dude that I would not drop because he's just going to be heavily involved as their wide receiver two going forward. It's going to come with terrible floor weeks like we just saw from this week, but it's also going to come with big big games and big plays. I'm hoping Gardner Minshew is a quarterback because if Aiden O'Connell's a quarterback, then I have way less faith in a player like him. But with Devontae Adams likely out of Las Vegas, it's just going to be Jacoby, Trey Tucker, Brock Bowers. Like Tucker's going to be the de facto wide receiver two running every single route. And he's a deep play waiting to happen at all times. So definitely wouldn't drop him either. And then lastly, if you got some luxury space on your bench, which no one really does, I think it's at this point, you know, based on rumors and reports, it's just a matter of time before Drake may gets onto the field, which I think is obviously good news for Jalen Polk, Pop Douglas and Hunter Henry. So if you want to, you know, spin a fucking wheel, if you want to roll a dice between which ones you like the most, I think they're all valid ads. If we take a look at the tight end position, I was all over Tucker Craft last week. So if you guys did not get him, that's on yo ass. I don't know what else to tell you. The only reasonable players that are kind of still available right now, uh, Brenton Strange has played well, but Evan Ingram's got to be back soon. Uh, Tyler Conklin is gaining a real chemistry with Aaron Rodgers, but fun fact, Tyler Conklin has legitimately not scored a touchdown in 31 consecutive regular season games. So take that for what it is. And then Colby Parkinson has games where like, He'll go four for fucking 12, but then he'll have 13 target games like he just had in this one. Um, coming back after the buy, so you can't even use him this week. He's more of a streaming tight end that like you don't want to use a roster spot on that you have to wait because it's, it's easy to get excited about him after this one game. But remember, he had four games in a row of fewer than nine PPR fantasy points. So wouldn't get overly excited about him. I will say the one player that's not on this list that we might need to think through here is Taysom Hill because Derek Carr got hurt last night. And Derek Carr is likely to miss somewhere between one to three weeks. Now, if we're looking at how the game played out, if we're looking at post-Derek Carr, we've seen Jake Hayner enter the game. Does that mean he's a starter next week? No, not over Spencer Rattler, but pointing in that direction. Derek Carr is out. There is a chance, and Taysom Hill has to be back, obviously healthy and playing. He's missed a game now, that Taysom Hill 
just becomes very involved in this offense as the hybrid quarterback. He is without a doubt worth rostering and owning just to see if he's active, if there's, you know, reports that say like, I don't I don't imagine Taysom Hill playing quarterback for them, but like you could see a world where he's playing quarterback on like 25% of the snaps. And if you're putting him into your fucking tight end position, if you're on a platform that allows him to be on the tight end position, that is like you can't talk about how fucking valuable that is with with cones like Mark Andrews out here putting up zero spots for you, okay? So Taysom Hill absolutely needs to be top of mind for you. Let's run through some streaming defenses for you real quick. Now, as I always say, we got a little bit of a formula. You always want to pick a defense that is expected to win their game. You want the spread here, like San Fran minus three and a half. They're expected to win by three and a half points. You want a team that's expected to win. You usually want teams that are playing at home. And the larger the spread, the better. Now, I'm going to skip past defenses that are likely owned in most leagues, like Chicago. The Packers, if they're unowned, this is a good spread we're looking at. They're five-point favorites. They're at home. Houston, seven-point favorites. Now, they're on the road, but they're playing against a banged-up Jacoby Brissett, even though Houston Texans are probably not available anywhere. Philly, maybe they're available for you. Coming off a bye, people might have dropped them. Eight-and-a-half-point favorites at home against just an atrocious offense in Cleveland, letting up 95 sacks a game. Love them. Baltimore's definitely not available anywhere. L.A. might be available, though, on the road as three-point favorites. I don't necessarily love that. Steelers, they're definitely not available anywhere. Lions, I'm probably staying away from that game. When the spread is really low like this and the over-under is really high, that's something I kind of look for. The Falcons, minus six and a half at Carolina. Don't like that they're on the road. However, Carolina is so banged up on both defense and now their offensive line. They lost like two or three of their offensive linemen this week, so... This is that's why the spread is so high because the injuries to Carolina are are piling up at a concerning rate. So I like Car- uh, I like Atlanta as a streamer here, and then Cincinnati. Uh, usually as a tiebreaker, I don't like to play teams that I just know are atrocious defenses, and there's just no other cinnamon synonym, synonym synonym you can use for the Cincinnati defense in 2024. So I'm probably just going to stay away from that game with Malik Neighbors likely back in the lineup. So let's move over to the list of trending down. Uh, I'm just going to run through these very quickly, whether I think you can drop them or whether I think you should hold on to them. And again, we also put our waiver wire rankings live on the site this morning. So if you just want to see our rankings for guys, what our actual fab suggestion is for them in terms of percentage, whatever, that's available on bdge.co. If you want to go cop a big dog membership, that is where you do so. It's a monthly membership that comes with our waiver wire rankings along with a lot of other stuff. But but if you go sign up on Underdog Fantasy for the first time, then you also get that package for free for the remainder of the season. So you get our weekly rankings, our waiver wire rankings. You get that free square that I showed you earlier in the video on Underdog all by just depositing 10 bucks with code BDGE on Underdog Fantasy. Jawan Jennings, I'm still going to hold on to him. Obviously, his... Uh, Usage is not great right now with all the weapons they have back. But I do think, yeah, I mean, he's not a a great start right now, but I'm still holding on to him. Rashi Rice, he's out for the season. You can drop him. Zach Ertz just is what he is if you expected anything different. Like, if you're going to drop him every time he has a bad game and then pick him up every time he has a good game, you're just going to get the same exact experience every time. Hill, uh, I like him for this week, so I wouldn't drop him. Like, Washington, that over-under, I think, is like 53 points right now. So he could be pretty heavily involved. Jerry Judy, uh, I mean, he's he's a flex week fill-in, bye week fill-in, I think. So I'd probably hold on to him. Trey Tucker already talked about I would hold on to him. Yoshivas is pretty much an afterthought at this point. And even during those weeks when T. Higgins was out, he was kind of an afterthought. So I'd be okay dropping him. Trey Sermon, I definitely would not drop because Jonathan Taylor might miss another game, might miss another two games. Antonio Gibson, I would hold on to. Not that you can really play him, but Ramondre did get banged up at the end of the game, and he's apparently fine and supposed to play this upcoming week. But if he comes in at less than 100%, maybe he gets re-injured. Then Gibson would obviously take on a very big workload. If Drake May gets under center, I think the offense just runs a lot more smoothly. Carson Steele, yep, unfortunately he is droppable. Manuel Wilson, probably droppable. I think Marshawn Lloyd should probably be back anytime soon. There's a there's probably a chance Wilson kind of just maintains that running back two role in this backfield. Yeah, I, I don't know. He, he He's fine. I, I might hold on to him if I have Jacobs. 
Akers, I dropped the shit out of him. Watson, yeah, he's pretty much unstartable right now. Naylor drop. Zeke, you could definitely drop. Sutton, I'd hold on to. I mean, like, obviously he had a bad game last game, but he was getting like 30% of the targets before then. Watson, you can drop on the bye week. Parkinson, again, just the Zach Ertz experience. Cole Komet, with this offense rolling and what their schedule looks like over the next six weeks, I wouldn't drop him. Wicks, absolutely don't drop him. He led the team in, like, targets and routes run. And in everything you wanted to see, including what you didn't want to see in drops, he led the team. Awesome matchup again against Arizona. Like, if you're going to pick up Wicks, you ride with the experience. You start him again against Arizona. Uh, and you could drop Tutu. I probably wouldn't drop Njoku. I think he re-injured himself, undergoing an MRI with his knee. So, at this point, it, it's pretty ugly. Uh, if you got an IR spot, I'd use it on him. If not, if you really need the spot, I'm okay dropping him. Fields wouldn't drop. Whittington definitely wouldn't drop. Johnston wouldn't drop. Samaja, you could drop. Uh, Madison wouldn't drop. Uh, I think he should probably be the workhorse again if Zamir White misses this game, but it is a tough matchup against Pittsburgh. Dobbs, definitely not dropping. Uh, Darnold, don't drop. Braylon Allen, definitely don't drop. Stafford, you know, if it's a streaming quarterback, I guess you could drop him. But again, I think their offense will get healthy and he healthier as the season progresses. Gabe Davis, fucking Cone, you could drop him. Evan Ingram should be back soon. Bo Melton, droppable. Clyde, I'd hold on just to see what the running back rotation looks like with one week of him. But then again, that might be weeks away. I don't know. Actually, you could probably fucking drop him. Keon Coleman wouldn't drop. Mike Kosicki, droppable. Khalil Shakir, definitely don't drop. Taysom Hill, as I already said, pick him up. Devin Singletary, of course, don't drop. What are we? What are we? Oh, I know what we're not doing, and that is spending money on Chase fucking McLaughlin. All right, that's it. I'm here. I'm not here. We're out. I love you. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Week six waiver wire in the books. Underdog fantasy code BDGE. I'll see you tomorrow.